Welcome to Mining Over Canada. Join the Canadian Securities Exchange and our partners in a first-hand look into our country's vast mining landscape. Experience its regions, meet the people, explore the history, and find out what comes next in one of Canada's richest industries. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Grace from the CSC, and I'm welcoming you to our weekly Tech Tuesday virtual session. This week, we will be highlighting private mining and exploration companies. Before I introduce our moderator today, I would like to take a moment to tell you more about CSC TV on YouTube. The Canadian Securities Exchange Forum for Conversations with Business Leaders and Entrepreneurs. I put a link on CSC TV in the chat room, which you can find to the right of your screen. I will also be posting the registration link for Mining Over Canada, the CSE's innovative digital series. This series features a six week cross country adventure profiling the history, work and future of the Canadian mineral resource sector from coast to coast. And now without further ado, I would like to welcome Mark Francis. Thank you, Grace. And to you, all everyone online, our attendees, for joining us live today, as with every Tuesday, starting 15 minutes after market close, typically with three private companies at various stages from North America and abroad. Next week, though, on the 3rd of November, we will have CSE listed companies with unique environmentally beneficial metallurgical technology, EnviroLeach, GTI, Nulox, LUX, and BackTech Environmental, BAC, and Barrington as your host. Today, we would like to thank Don Duval and Norcat, the mining technology incubator based in Sudbury, and thank you to them for bringing us two of our three companies. For those who heard my spiel last week about the challenges of introducing innovation in the mining industry, bear with me and this iteration. Maybe warm up your tea. On the exploration side, where there are no cascading punishments for being wrong, industry has fearlessly created and adapted technology. Two examples would be the adoption of geophysics and an ever more complex and clever variations, and the astounding processes for harvesting unique information from soil samples, even using bacterial waste streams, the gases that come off them, to identify specific potential mineralization. When it comes to a mining operation where each deposit is unique, with large lenders concerned about risk and having effective operational vetoes, governments concerned about environmental impacts and industry safety associations with high standards, implementing something new must be done very carefully and precisely. And the challenge is that changing one item in the middle of a mining operation triggers multiple changes elsewhere. Furthermore, if it doesn't work, running financial losses almost invariably correlates with higher safety and environmental risks and an inability to adapt to new technologies which require capital investment. So adoption of a technology which doesn't work can endanger an entire operation. One example comes to mind. In the 1990s, a very smart person came up with a unique way of treating the vanadium wastes, vanadium being a not so nice metal for the environment and life in general when it isn't being used in the right application, and which are found in oil sands tailings. The company let the innovator onto their property, and when it didn't work properly on a commercial sale in that application, the result was even worse than the vanadium content uh, normally in the streams, and the result was a disastrous mess. Cleanup costs well into the tens of millions and possibly higher. So caution is mandatory. These are some of the inherent reasons why it took the mining industry several attempts to introduce its first all-electric mine with then Gold Corp finally succeeding at the Borden Mine in Ontario just a few years ago. But the industry is constantly innovating and working to do things better and smarter, and NORCAT is a good example of this. Uh, for an example of planned, planned innovation in new mines, take a look at Rockcliffe Metals, our CLF on CSE. The CEO, Alistair Ross, speaks cogently on being in the forefront of change in the mining industry and is leading a team which is planning mine developments which will draw together many relatively new technologies and innovations from the outset. So our objective in running Tech Tuesdays is twofold. First, to help technology companies with increasing traction to gain relevant visibility, and second, to help capital markets players by introducing interesting companies, focusing on whether the technology will have commercial traction and why, and also providing new knowledge of what is happening in innovation. 
For you as attendees, we do ask that you share ideas and feedback with our presenters, leads, possibly funding after due diligence, referral of someone with unique applicable expertise, or maybe even a potential strategic relationship. You can find their contact information in the chat board. With respect, we might refrain from giving management advice unless we are truly experts in the company's particular field. And please don't treat our presenting companies as marketing targets for services. Some housekeeping matters. You will note a red reconnect tab at the top of your screen will appear if you lose audio. Just click it and you will be reconnected. In the event there are technical problems, we may hit the restart, in which case there is no action required by you. The system will re automatically reconnect everyone. The chat board may be utilized to ask serious questions. Please be clear as to whom your question is being addressed, and our question moderator, Ron Higgs, will try to get to them. Note our disclaimer. This presentation is for information only and is not a solicitation to make an investment in either shares or debt or to buy or sell stock. CESE and Mark Francis' session host, i.e. yours truly, make no representation about any of these companies. If you are interested in the investor pitch, please connect with the companies directly in order to get detailed information. Each company will have a seven minute presentation with their PowerPoint. When you see my face appear, the company has 15 seconds to wrap up. After all companies have presented, we'll move to Q&A today led by Ron Higgs, a fractional chief operating officer and consultant. So today we have as presenters, Pierre Gaucher, Quebec City, CEO of GDD Instrumentation, who would surely have been nominated by lots of prospectors if they had the chance, but I personally nominated him today. Nader Elm, CEO of Exxon Technologies, nominated by NORCAT, and Shelby Lee of Toronto, CEO of Rock Mass Technologies, also nominated by NORCAT. Let's start with Pierre Gaucher. Pierre Gaucher holds a, mining, a degree in mining engineering from Laval University. He worked about two years as a miner, mining engineer, foreman, and mine captain at an underground gold mine for tech. He then gained an MBA at the École des Hautes Études Commerciales in Montreal. He worked for five years in sales for IBM Canada Limited before joining GDD in 1991, founded by his father, where he now leads the group as the president and major owner. Pierre. So let's start. Uh, Instrumentation GD is a company that was uh, um, started back in 1976 by my father. Um, we are a worldwide company. We uh, deal um, all around the world, uh, South America, Russia, China, uh, Africa, Australia. Uh, we have developed uh, be, by my background as a mining engineer, we have developed instruments that are related to the exploration, prospecting to the exploration for finding mines, and also into the mining. Uh, I'll get more into that. But some of the success were to basically define where's the ore within the, within the blast holes and uh, be able to reduce dilution. Some of the mines were able to increase their ore grade at the mill by up to 10%, for instance, which means that there's a ROI or less than one day. Here's the group, my father, PhD from Harvard and uh, Regis. Some of the instruments. So the IP transmitter along with the IP receiver give you the ability to send energy into the ground and to see in 2D and 3D. Most of the problem comes from the fact that people have a very uh, dry environment, so they need a very high voltage, which we were the first in the world to do to achieve that. The same way with the receiver, we we're the first in the world. The use of the technology allow you to uh, get uh, in place where you, you could now do, instead of doing one line, you could do it in 3D and see in real time uh, what you're doing, and you could even monitor from, uh, say, Canada, what's going on in uh, Australia or Africa. Um, this gives you great advantage um, if you want to extend uh, the ore that you have within a mine or in the future to see from multiple holes at great depth. So instead of being limited to the first 500 meters, some people could now think to go to depth of several um, uh, 
thousand meters because you could have the information with you at that or you could do it different ways but like having a diamond drill hole and energize a hole and see from the surface where is the extension of the ore so you can minimize the uh, diamond drill uh, and uh, get right where is the extension instead of going and finding nothing uh, the product gives you the ability to control everything to the bush uh, we also have developed very small uh, product that are portable that give you the ability to find the physical properties. I'll get back to that, the importance of physical property. This product, the skip tester, gives you the ability to define the chargeability and resistivity. In other words, if you have something that is disseminated, uh, you could define how much ore you have into the core, how much sulfides. Uh, the MPP is a similar product. It's a portable probe. It works the same way uh, on the core, but this time it's like a metal detector. Uh, it's a unique product because it gives you the ability to read in real time the conductivity and the magnetic. Uh, so for instance, if you have a, a gold mine with uh, uh, alteration, uh, a change in the uh, alteration could be picked up by a change in magnetite and therefore you could define exactly where you should be sampling get exactly the right area where you got some uh, great gold grades so you avoid sampling where there's nothing this is an example the other way is if you have something conductive at the same time you'll be able to get everything at the same time directly on the display either with a graph or data, you could do it punctual and continuous mode. So it's a pretty small device, but give you a lot of information. The Nordic EM was uh, developed jointly with Anglo-American, it was tested in Finland to give you an idea. It's like a middle detector, but it goes deeper. Uh, we were able to find targets up to 800 meters below surface from the surface, and it was diamond drill and uh, what was there was expected and was successful. Uh, normally, people were able to read 30,000 readings per second. We increased that to 120,000. And recently, we increased that to 1.44 million readings per second, which is make it the fastest in the world. Um, the beatman is similar to the uh, Giger counter many years ago. Uh, the Giger counter was found, and within a few years, back in Seven Tree, right after the crisis, petroleum crisis. People using the Giger Hunter were able to double World World Reserve uranium. This device is similar in the sense that it will detect conductors, bad conductors and weak conductors. And you'll be able to trench it and pick up a sample. So it's much cheaper and much faster. And you could even drag it behind a snowmobile at 70k per hour. So it gives you the ability to cover a lot of ground cheaply and to follow up with GPS exactly where you could be finding new stuff. Why I'm speaking about the physical property, this is an example of a mine that was in exploitation north of Quebec called the Opemiska mine. And my son, uh, who presented at the SCG in the United States uh, back in Dallas uh, 97, 9, 2016, it shows the copper here at the top in figure eight. You could see there's a continuity in the copper and you have a conductivity up to 4,000 on the figure six. If you go at the bottom where the grade, instead of being about four or 5% at the bottom, you have uh, easily 17%. You could see that it's disseminated, but the conductivity is about 40 times less than the low grade. So one would believe that the higher the conductivity, the more copper, it's not always the case. So the physical property associated to the physical, uh, whether it's conductive or magnetic, will give you an idea of what's going on. So basically these are examples or different era where it has been used, uh, even in India. So that's a wrap up of what we've been doing, helping people to do a better job. Thanks everyone. Thank you very much, Pierre. And now Shelby Yi. Shelby holds a bachelor's degree in geological engineering and has previously worked in the oil and gas and transportation sectors. Shelby, Shelby is an alumna of 
several innovation programs, including the Hacks Hardware Accelerator, Next Founders of Next Canada, and the Creative Destruction Lab. Prior to founding RockMass, Shelby founded conferences focused on women in engineering and social innovation, while also having experience working in planning and operations. Shelby, all yours. Thanks, Mark. So everyone, hi everyone, I'm the CEO and, and co-founder of RockMass, and we're a mining technology company. I'm going to interrupt a moment, Toronto. Shelby. Just interrupting. Pierre, can you click off your video icon? Thank you. <laughs> um, we, we could have put co-presented, I suppose, but <laughs> I guess I'll continue. Uh, and we provide data collection and management solutions to improve operational efficiencies and safety. And right now we focus specifically on geotechnical and geological applications. Um, but just to give a little bit of a background, when we're looking at a mine, there's a couple of main factors uh, to determine the value. One is the estimated asset value and the all-in sustaining costs or ASIC. And a big part of ASIC is their estimated production rate. And if we back up a little bit further, um, the initial value of the, the mining operation is discovered or determined in advanced exploration, uh, largely through drill core. But drill core is fairly expensive and there's still gaps that have to be filled in by models to estimate what is actually going to happen when you begin operating. And once you do start operating a mine, the models must be continuously refined. But in almost every single circumstance, the model isn't actually what happens in reality. And so new operational data is necessary to make better informed decisions. And the speed of receiving that data is really important because the ASIC can be brought down by the faster or more efficient you make these processes. And so faster and more accurate decisions um, can lead to a closer true value um, of your asset or the mine than, than what uh, you expected. But we see that operations aren't always able to realize this full potential in their asset value or their ASIC. And one of the main reasons is because the data collection that feeds the models is very time consuming to collect. It can be inconsistent and it can be inaccurate. And some of the tools that are available today just aren't designed to provide this real time uh, capture. So it makes the uh, data very difficult to use on a day to day basis. And actually, over 90% of ground control engineers uh, still do their inspections using a pen and paper. And a ground control engineer will be responsible for understanding the rock quality, looking at possible failure planes to best create a ground support design. And when they're using lower quality or maybe inconsistent data, it leads to generic support patterns, which take more time or cost more to install, or they may unearth unexpected hazards as they continue to develop. And just to summarize all of this, uh, engineers are collecting data manually. It's time consuming, it's inconsistent, and this is leading to out of date models, which can increase that delta between what is expected and what's actually realized in their asset value. And it's also increasing uh, the ASIC. So this is because of delayed decision making. And this is exactly what Dr. Joshua Marshall saw when he was on site one time in, back in 2012. You saw these engineers collecting uh, information manually, and he thought there has to be a better way that we can capture this information using technology. So him and Dr. Mark Gallant teamed up in 2012 to create a, a better way. And four years later in 2016, they had published a paper, filed a patent for a rapid approach to geotechnical mapping, and more specifically, stereo, generation, stereo net generation for underground environments. And this is when my co-founder, Matt, and I met Mark and Josh. And being a geological engineer myself and seeing their technology, I immediately thought this could definitely be impactful in industry. This is a type of mapping and data collection that I had done similarly uh, in the field. And I knew how time consuming or inconsistent it could be. So we had to keep building this to bring it to market somehow. So in 2016, we started 
just driving to mine sites in Ontario to understand just exactly what was going on within their operations at a very detailed level. And by 2017, we had enough validation and, and a business case and some of the technology development to receive our first investment. This was from a venture capital firm called Sean O'Sullivan Ventures or SOSV. It's one of the largest and most active industrial hardware uh, funds. And we also started working closely with Norcat's test site at this period in time. And by 2018, we partnered with a large zinc producer to continue the final uh, commercialization aspects of the product. In 2019, we released the Access Mapper, and it's a mobile data collection tool for ground control engineers. And actually, just a week ago, we released the second version, which is what you see in this slide right now. And so it uses a short range LIDAR sensor or a depth sensor and a positioning sensor, so an inertial, inertial measurement unit. And it captures a big spatial 3D point cloud model. And what our algorithms do is we distill this big data set down into information that's usable for engineers right away, so numerical data. And this process typically takes an engineer almost six hours to do, and we're boiling it into minutes while providing them with higher quality data. And the mining industry can also be fairly stubborn to embrace new technologies. So we knew we had to make this really easy to adapt and to automatically import to software models and software suites that they're already using. So we like to say, if you can use a digital camera, if you can use a cell phone, then you can definitely use our Axis Mapper. To date, we're primarily working with underground mines in North America, and we have a couple in, in South America too, and we're just starting to work within the tunneling sector as well. And ultimately, we want to enable engineers to have access to consistent and accurate data in a seamless way to reduce their model uncertainty and decrease their all in sustaining costs. We just closed a seed financing round of 2 million. Some of the uh, funds include BDC and SOSV and some strategic angel investors. And we have about a dozen people using the product in North America and, and a few in, in South America too. And so between now and our Series A, a big focus is expanding our presence within North America, but also international markets, and then releasing a new software suites to um, service more of the departments within the underground market. So thanks very much. Feel free to reach out for a demo or to learn more about future investment opportunities. Thanks. Thank you, Shelby and Nader Elm. Nader has spent his professional career in fast growth technology domains, progressively moving from engineering roles to leadership of startups and strategic growth initiatives in large enterprises. Nader joined as CEO at the company's formation in 2014, having come from IMAX. Nader, all yours. Uh, thank you, Mark. And uh, I'd like to also thank you, Shelby, uh, because I think some of the uh, framing of the problem sets is actually very, very common. So uh, to as uh, Mark said, you know, we were formed in 2014 as a spin out of the University of Pennsylvania, leveraging the research going on over there. Um, if you're in the world of robotics, you would recognize Penn. They're one of the foremost uh, institutions in the world when it comes to robotics. And uh, there's a gentleman there by the name of Dr. Vijay Kumar, whose research uh, is very well known. He's actually uh, not only well published, he's done two TED Talks and also served a year in the White House uh, advising on cyber systems policies over there. But what he's really famous for is really two things. Um, number one, uh, the development of fully autonomous vehicles. And number two, uh, what would it look like to have multiple uh, autonomous vehicles collaborating and cooperating with each other, i.e. Uh, a swarm. So uh, essentially the core technology that we've built uh, focuses on what you see over here, a fully autonomous aerial platform that flies itself. Uh, and I'll go into what we mean by autonomy in a second, uh, but the interesting thing is as uh, core technology is a spin out from university that's really interesting, uh, but ultimately that's not what people buy. So what people buy is a solution to a problem, and the problem that we're solving is data acquisition in really, really difficult and dangerous places. 
Uh, because one of the things we realized is that while there were many, many tools out over there, uh, big data tools, which do great analysis on large data sets, there are certain industries that uh, where the data acquisition, data collection itself is actually the challenging problem. And that is where robotics really lends itself well. So uh, what better example than going into underground mines, into those areas where people should never go and collect data. So what you're seeing over here on the bottom right is a perfect example. Uh, this is a stope. So this is the cavity that's created at the end of the tunnels that uh, Shelby was showing. And at the end of the tunnels, you drill, you pack uh, explosives and you blast. Uh, so, and then you extract the uh, muck, the ore. Uh, that area, the cavity that's left behind, is inherently dangerous. It's structurally unsound. You should never go into it uh, because it's a risk of rockfall that would uh, actually kill people. And uh, just to give you an idea of the dimensions, these things can be up to about uh, 20, 30, 40 meters deep and up to about 100 meters tall. So um, that's where the operations are, but it also happens to be, by the nature of its uh, the dangerous environment, also where you've got the least information, and therefore operations are very, very challenged in terms of understanding what just happened, how do we plan what to do next. So the uh, act of actually capturing the data is typically expensive, infrequent, and inaccurate. So that is basically where we send in the robots, and this is basically what it looks like. So this is a fully autonomous aerial platform. Uh, and up until today, this would have been the slide I would show everyone. But as of today, we are launching our newest variant of the product uh, called the X and Aero. So this, you are the first audience to actually see this. Um, and essentially what you're seeing over here is uh, an aerial platform that flies itself without a pilot in the loop. So fully autonomous. Now. Unfortunately, the word autonomy uh, doesn't really have that much of a definition and therefore everyone claims to have it. So what do we mean by autonomy? Robotic system typically has about four tethers and we've systematically gone and severed uh, the four tethers that aid a robot in uh, doing what it needs to do. So the first tether is a tether to any kind of infrastructure in the environment. So for example, there is no GPS. We do not require GPS, we do not require markers or any kind of beacons in the environment. The robot has to fi uh, figure itself out uh, in terms of where it is, much like you and I do. The second thing is there is no requirement for consistent communications. So typically and more frequently, our robots go into these environments and they lose communications, but that doesn't jeopardize the nature of the mission. The third thing is any kind of prior information. Think of a map. So basically, most of our missions for the robot is to go into unknown environments and build that map. And I'll show you some examples of that. And then finally, uh, any kind of tether to a expert. So you do not have to be a drone expert. You do not have to be a robotics expert to be able to operate this. Actually, we want to make sure that it's uh, sufficiently easy to use so that anyone can actually pick it up and use it within 15 minutes. So with that, uh, the next thing is basically, why do people care? So what you're seeing over here is a comparison of what people are doing today using uh, current state of the art in terms of cavity monitoring and what we generate on the right hand side. And the critical things to uh, notice over here is the fact that on the left hand side, there's a you know, density of points uh, in one area, but very, very sparse towards the bottom. That's because the sensor is actually uh, constant and fixed in one location in the scanning the environment. Whereas what we do is we carry the sensor all the way through the cavity and we can paint all facets of uh, the features of the walls as we're going up. And the other thing is, so we generate 1000 times more data. So it's a lot richer, a lot more uh, detail. It's a lot faster. So uh, in comparison to what takes typically about four hours on the left-hand side, we do in about three minutes. Uh, by virtue of actually flying through the cavity, we also cover off all the occlusions. And because it is a fully automated robotic system, you'll notice on the bottom right, um, we can start far back in the safety of the tunnel. So you do not have to get close to the brow uh, where there's a risk of uh, rockfall or rock slide. So basically, 
a much higher level of safety operating th this kind of equipment. So that's um, a direct comparison, but once you actually start looking at, for example, volumetric analysis, what you'll see over here, uh, like for like uh, scan from two different systems, there's a 20% uh, variance in this particular scope in terms of the actual volume. And that has cascading impacts in a variety of different things. So uh, the music's gonna start playing, so I'm gonna uh, quickly show you some of the other uh, point clouds that we've generated. Uh, but the most important thing is also the fact that, uh, you know, we've deployed, we've uh, established a relationship with Sandvik, uh, who have selected us as their aerial partner. We've deployed in uh, Canada and across the world and received many, many awards. So I'll stop it there so that we can um, basically address any questions that might be. Thank you, Nader. And now we will bring back all of our panelists for the Inquisition. And today we have as question moderator, Ron Higgs, Wolf Management Solutions, a fellow angel investor and fractional chief operating officer and management consultant for hire who focuses on rapidly growing companies with over 20 years experience in operations, engineering management and program management in the aerospace and defense industry and many awards. Ron has a Bachelor of Science in Applied Mathematics from the U.S. Naval Academy and a, and a Master's in System Engineering from the Naval Postgraduate School. He served as a Naval Flight Officer and a Program Management Acquisition Professional. Highlights of his career and include flying combat missions from an aircraft carrier in the Gulf, serving as a Program Manager for several Navy Research and Development Programs, and serving as Spacecraft Manager for a DOD satellite system where he gave the final spacecraft go He's a graduate of the U.S. Naval Test Pilot School and has flown over 2,500 hours in multiple aircraft types. And since leaving active duty, Ron has worked in several industries and held leadership positions in startups, small companies, and large corporations. Ron, you are in charge. Great. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, everyone, for your presentations. Really enjoyed hearing about your products. Um, since we're virtual here, um, I will just call on you in order to answer the questions. And so the first question I have for you all is that uh, your presentations provided a lot of information about products, uh, but not so much about the companies, it's, uh, you know, your individual companies. So if you can tell us a little bit more about your company, uh, your clients, uh, some of the strategic partners you have, what priorities you have and your company goals. So let's start with Nader. Okay, right. Uh, so the company, we are actually based in Philadelphia, spin up from the University of Pennsylvania. We're up to about 40 people right now. We're VC backed as well. We've raised uh, 20 million to date. Uh, in terms of our um, customer base, we uh, I focused on mining in deference to the audience over here. We have deployments in uh, Canada, US, uh, Europe, and uh, right now actually we have a team in Africa doing an installation over there. So we've got uh, certain global coverage and growing, but we've also attracted the interest of the US government that want to take our robots into other unknown dangerous environments to do other kinds of data acquisition. I can imagine. Uh, Pierre. Yes, uh, Instrumentation GD is about 20 people. Uh, we have a uh, been dealing with uh, people around the world, uh, judges, uh, exploration group, mining, uh, prospectors. Um, we are having fun uh, dealing with um, people who are facing problems and finding solutions. So lots of our uh, people who are testing our uh, new products are the end user, the uh, initiator, like the 3% in providing us feedbacks. Um, lately, uh, we had, um, uh, like in the past years, 20, 40 years, most people have been using a transfer with a receiver and basically doing 2D lines and then eventually 3D lines allowing you to find things that are crossing the line in between the lines. But now people are starting to use it on a bigger scale. And so using one transmitter, one receiver, they're looking to use maybe 50 receivers at the same time and get a bigger picture of everything um, on a large scale. So uh, we're looking in the near future to start to work with some key players 
and um, basically work out some solutions, innovative solution, either with the mines or um, uh, depth, increased depth, and also be involved a bit more into the water. Water being a, uh, more and more important for many, many people, having a hotter and drier uh, environment all around the world. That's great. Right. Thank you, Shelby. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so we're based in Toronto and, and similar, similar to Axon, we're a spin-off company from Queen's University. And we're about 15 people now and we have all of our engineering on in-house. So whether that's hardware, software, um, geological, um, we do all of that. And so we're based, we're focused primarily in North America, but um, yeah, have some other projects in other regions and we're actually starting to work with some software modeling providers to just better integrate our our technologies seamlessly with theirs. All right, thank you. So as everyone's heard, you know, people are your greatest assets, right? So you can have a great uh, product, you know, uh, but still you need great people to uh, to build your company. So in in keeping with that, uh, can you each talk about your leadership team and your board and, and why it's the right group of people to take you from where you are to where you want to be? So let's start with Pierre this time. Okay. Um, I got a, a great variety of people coming from uh, all around the world. I got Chinese, uh, Russian, uh, Roma uh, Romanian, Tunisian. Um, and I could keep going, uh, South America and so on. So they, they all have different skills and uh, we got to focus on developing things and bring all the people together jointly with the people into the field and finding solution, innovative solution that help the people into the field to do a better job, faster job, and go deeper, and faster and make more money basically. Um, we we also had the ability to work with large groups uh, all around the world. We 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 deal with uh, BHP, Rio Tinto, Anglo American, um, Anglo Gold Ashanti, etc. So we we have fun uh, doing that. And uh, as you mentioned, the people are key, and it's very important. I'm sort of the uh, often I see ways of doing things, so I I push them to find solution. So we're putting in place uh, uh, new ways of doing things, trying to get to a second stage and be able to get the next wave. Do you have a board of advisors? Uh, nope, we don't. OK. Shelby, you next. Yeah, our, our leadership team is honestly fairly small at this point. Our company is just 15 people in total. But if you look at that and their strategic advisors, their experiences in mining B2B technology and technology commercialization, um, we do have a board. And, and similarly, it, it's focused in financing, mining, um, the usual things, corporate governance. Um, but we basically have a, a core group of people that do have a lot of experience in these individual sectors or applications that we can always go to um, with some of our key decisions and, and kind of work through them together. All right, Nader? <laughs> yeah, so uh, we have uh, three people in the uh, C-suite. So there's myself, uh, we have a chief technology officer whose background uh, is a PhD from uh, University of Pennsylvania and actually was uh, one of the top teams in the DARPA Urban Challenge. So this is the precursor to the driverless cars, the research that went on over there. So very, very deep understanding of all things autonomous. And our chief auto uh, operating officer um, has had startup experience, uh, product development experience, and so on, and uh, building teams. And you're right, I mean, building talent it's difficult across the board uh, in any of the fields that we're in right now because there's a lot of uh, uh, demand for these kinds of skills and experiences from the big, uh, very well-funded uh, startups as well as big uh, tech companies like Google and Facebook. Um, so uh, we've been very fortunate to build a stellar, stellar team. In terms of the, our board, it's mostly 
kind of a consist of the investors, but we also have an independent who happens to be, uh, you know, previously the uh, Secretary of uh, uh, Def um, Assistant Secretary of Defense for Acquisitions. So having an understanding of the uh, government world, and we do have uh, subject matter experts as advisors in both the te technology of robotics as well as industry experts. Great, thank you. So well, let's shift a little bit to growth. Uh, I'm sure everybody wants to grow. So if you guys could talk about your current strategy for growth and then talk to us about, you know, are you focused on growing organically or raising capital to grow and how you decided uh, on your growth methodology? So let's start this time with Shelby. Yeah, so I discussed we just finished closing a, a seed financing round. So we are backed by a venture capital firm and some strategic investors as well. And I would say building a, a hardware company and then a hardware company that's in the mining industry is initially fairly capital intensive. And so if you want to be able to grow it at a certain rate, I think it's been very important to have uh, financing to do that. So um, that's been our approach. And I think one of the things that's really great about uh, building a company in Canada is there's a lot of non-dilutive programs that can also be matched with all of the financing that you're able to obtain. So that's been our strategy to date. And um, we plan on raising a, a Series A in um, a couple years time as well. Okay, thank you. Nader? Right, yeah, I'll underscore everything that Shelby said. You know, it's, uh, we're also a hardware software play. So uh, we definitely needed uh, startup capital. So we went out to VC market for that. We've uh, completed a Series A back in 2019. So for the focus for us in terms of growth is very much, um, you know, there is an organic element to it. We've uh, got a product, we've proven product market fit. So we're trying to scale in the two markets we're in. We're trying to find a third market to move into an adjacent market. Uh, but also, I mean, we're, we're planning to do a uh, next round uh, sometime later on next year uh, to propel our growth, uh, both in terms of technology development, but also our uh, entry into new markets with new products. Great, thank you very much. Pierre? Um, we, uh, we've been uh, dealing uh, basically with our base. We're looking to increase our visibility a little bit using different ways as uh, uh, the different platform. Like uh, we've been dealing a lot with uh, our website and responding to the uh, requests, but we're looking to be a little bit more aggressive through our database and being going uh, after that. On a different approach, uh, we're also looking potentially to use another company where we would use the technology to find mines. So if there were investor looking to, uh, there's ways of using the technology to do a better job within the mine to be more profitable, but there's ways of using the technology to find mines and there's a big leverage. So we got approach that could lead to a fast track and finding things faster. So that, that could be something if we got, uh, I'm not looking for going on the market, but looking for maybe some people who are maybe interested in doing something special. In that sense, I could explain it using the beat map, basically. So that's well. Thank you. So to, to follow up on that a little bit, uh, let talk about some of your um, your client acquisition and marketing strategy moving forward. Start with uh, Nader. Yeah, for us, I mean, uh, initially, I mean, we're not mining experts. So we had to establish uh, direct relationships with uh, mining customers, even just to have access to the problem, going underground and uh, testing uh, not only our technology, but also making sure there's a good fit uh, in terms of the data sets that we provide. So now uh, we continue to do direct uh, relationships with our customers, but we've also uh, started recently signing on partners who give us access to uh, new markets and uh, new customers. So uh, as I mentioned, you know, we've recently partnered with Sandvik uh, going globally, but we're also signing on partners in uh, Africa and Australia, where obviously a lot of mining operations are. Uh, 